Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. Today is the fifth episode of the seven episode series, Reduced Concepts. And today I'm going to talk about something a little bit more uh, tricky, a little bit more difficult to talk about. But I think these uh, concepts are equally reduced or, or similarly reduced to the concepts of rituals um, and the bigger topics such as freedom and, um, and jihad and, and whatnot. And, and, and the, uh, the theme of these concepts for today are, are one way or another, um, the relationships or the sexuality of the, of the, of the human race and how, how Islam sees aspects of that and how we maybe have been led to understand certain, certain things and maybe how we have to go back and understand them a little bit differently. And I'm going I'm to discuss the concept of chastity, which is iffa, and, and discuss love, uh, the word itself, what it means and you know, how we understand it and how Islam basically has explained it to us or how Islam understands it and then gender relations in general, gender issues maybe, it was better than gender relations, probably gender issues, but uh, I, it's too late now to change that. So I'll start with talk, by talking about uh, iffa or chastity. This is a big word within, within Islam, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a strong Islamic value and it has a lot of um, weight in the way that we understand ourselves as Muslims, mainly being that, the main reason being that uh, Islam and the Abrahamic faiths in general. So you'll find this across, yeah, not just within Islam, you'll find it within Judaism and Christianity as well. Now we have an understanding of, um, of how we carry our sexuality as human beings is very different than what the modern world uh, agrees to or what other faiths that are not necessarily Abrahamic in background uh, tend to have. Even though, if you go back to some of the, the or origins of these faiths, you'll find similar rulings in the in the uh, kind of older versions of their books or the early teachings of their uh, of their religions. But you know, not not to get into a, you know, a historical argument with the people who have different uh, faiths. Um, today, they just don't they don't carry that same understanding of things. And as Muslims specifically, we for sure have a have a, have a comprehension of what uh, chastity or ifa is that is different than what uh, the rest of the world uh, does. And that's okay. It's okay, it actually is important. It's not even, you know, the word okay is, is kind of an understatement. It's actually important for us as Muslims to identify where we differ with the world and what do we differ. Like it's important and it's important for your kids to know exactly where they're going to be different than people who are with them at school or people they're working, going to work with or you know, their friends that are going to be that are outside of you know, the Muslim you know, the community. It's important that like, you understand where they differ because if you know where you differ, then you know what to watch out for. You know where, you know, okay, at this point we kind of part ways. You do this, I do something a little bit different. Um, you, know, it's, it's no, you can do whatever you want as long as I you know, have the liberty and the ability to do you know, what, I, what I want and I, I, I protect myself. And most Muslims have a, a reasonable you know, approach to that, especially when it comes to food, for example. You know, if you're going out with the friends who aren't Muslim, you, know, they, you, you tend to state that I don't, I'm not going to eat pork, I look for halal, you know, I don't drink at my table, or you, know, you drink, you know, try not to. Like, these are aspects of our... So this is the same thing. When it comes to if or chastity, it's the same thing. We just have a different way of understanding human relationships and how, how they're going to be uh, carried and how we kind of express ourselves sexually and how we see that and, and how we identify ourselves in that manner and how we deal with this, this topic in general. So I want to start by talking about ifa because ifa has been reduced to, to one word. It's been reduced to the word hijab that's been reduced to a piece of cloth. This is the reduction that has happened over, over the years. Again, as I've stated, yani, this is the fifth time, the fifth halaqah is the fifth statement that I'll make, that I'm not saying that the things that these concepts or values have been reduced to are not good. No, they're very important, they're good. It's just when you reduce something that big to just one slither, to just one piece of it, first of all, that piece has to carry more than its weight. It can't carry all of that on its own because it's just a piece. It's just a, a, a yeah, it's like you have five compartments and you're putting the whole, the, you know, the, the weight of the whole uh, project in one of them. And of course, it's going, to, it's going to fall. It's going to collapse. It can't carry. It wasn't designed to carry all of that. So yeah, when you reduce the concept of chastity to one word, to hijab, to one word, which is yeah, the, the piece of cloth, now you're asking this one thing to carry a, a complete, yeah, a full Islamic value on its own. That's impossible. It's not going to be able to do that, which becomes way too much burden on, on, the, on the sisters who are, who, are, you know, who are stuck with this word. Again, it doesn't mean that hijab is not a part of ifa. It for sure is. And the piece of cloth is also a, a part of it, for sure. But it's not the, it's not the only thing. And that's what the, the point of this series. The point of this series was just to say, let's, let's step, step back a bit and see if we, can, if we can identify that these values or these concepts have become skeletons or shells of what's, what they once were. And we're left with a very small piece of each of them that actually does not serve yeah, the purpose for anyone. Like it does not help the community, it does not help the individual either. So when, when you take the word hijab and you want to, yeah, you define, if, you, if you do accept the word hijab, because what hijab means for there to be a barrier. 
That's what hajab is, is you put a barrier between something and something else so they, they can't see it. And mahjub is the one who is deprived from, from visibility. He, he, can't, he can't be seen or he can't be accessed. The person can't be accessed, which is, which is a, you know, due to a barrier. So the concept of hijab, uh, outside of, yani, again, kind of zooming out from the, uh, the physical usage of it, or which, which is basically that, the, yani, the, the, the head cover, we're talking about there being a barrier. There being boundaries, basically. The word barrier in, you know, in Arabic, it, you, can, you can translate that pretty easily to, to a boundary. But there to be boundaries. So it's not just a, uh, you know, a way of a dress code. No, it's also a social, it's, it's a form of social behavior. It's, a, it's the way, it's the social contract that we have amongst ourselves as Muslim men and Muslim women living within the Muslim community. It includes a dress code for both genders, for sure. It includes that. Part of that is that we have to dress in a certain way. As Muslim men, we have to do as well. Like a Muslim man cannot walk around naked. A Muslim man can't walk around dressed in a way that is showing off his own body parts either. Yeah, there's a certain dress code for us. Is it more uh, strict for women? For sure it is. For sure it is. That's just the part of, the, of, of, this, uh, of this equation. But the dress code exists for both. However, hijab is a social, it's a, it's a form of social behavior. It's a way that we deal with one another within a community. It's, you, it becomes useless when it's, when, it, when it's reduced to a piece of cloth that doesn't have the social behavior in, in the back of it. Like, without the social behavior, then we're missing something. And because we've reduced it to the piece of cloth, guys don't get this talk. Because, because we've done that, because we've reduced يعني, ifa, to hijab, to a piece of cloth that a lady puts on her head, men are completely excluded from this conversation, so they don't get a ifa talk. Like, they, they don't get that. They're not talked to about يعني, how they should be dealing with women, how they should speak to them, how they should view them. You know, their own sexuality, they don't get this talk at all because, the, because, because ifa, which is the word that's going to be used to understand how we act in a sexual meaning, like how we understand ourselves sexually and express ourselves, we've just removed men from it altogether, which is why you end up having you know, young men who don't know how to act around women and they don't know how to treat them and they don't know how to view them or understand them or even you know, they, they have a, they have a, a problem, a, a pathologic yeah, I need a perspective of, of the, the opposite gender because of the fact that we have, we have removed them from this conversation to begin with. If you go back to the Prophet Wasallam's life, you don't find it to be the case. Not at all. Ali Wasallam had these discussions with men, with young men, multiple times. Like all the young Sahaba, like Ibn Abbas, like Ibn Mas'ud, like Zayd ibn Thabit, like Zayd ibn Haritha. He had these discussions with them, alayhi salatu wasalam. He himself was involved in, yani, in helping them get married. He told them what to, what to look for. He told them you know, who to look for. He told them how to deal with their wives. He would be there to help them deal with problems and to point things out. And then he was always though there when it didn't work out and there needed to be a divorce. He was a part of that as well, alayhi salatu wasalam. Doesn't mean he attended every wedding, not at all. But he was a part of the, process, of the thought process. And, he was making, and people were educated by him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Doesn't mean take all these hadith that talk about marriage that are directed towards men, they're, they were directed towards men. Within Islam, just, this is like an FYI, just a, a, side, uh, a side point. There are things the Prophet ﷺ did not say on the minbar. Like he didn't get on the minbar and say them because they were words or they were pieces of advice that were directed towards a specific group. So when you read the hadith that are directed towards men in terms of how they're supposed to be dealing with ladies, how they're supposed to deal with their spouses, how they should be looking for marriage. Most of these hadith, if not all of them, were hadith or, or words or advice the Prophet ﷺ offered men when he was speaking only to them. And a lot of the hadith that are addressing women in terms of يعني, what they should be doing in their lives, how they should be treating their spouses, how they should be looking for all that, it was not addressed on the minbar either. It was addressed, it was addressed in sessions where it was only women who's only speaking to them. So when, when someone takes a hadith, <laughs> where the Prophet ﷺ was speaking specifically to women, and they use it in a public setting, it becomes a problem, because that's, what not, the, that's not what this hadith was, was, uh, yani was designed to be used for. It was not designed to be used in a public setting. This hadith was the Prophet ﷺ offering his daughters and his sisters and his wives advice between him as a teacher, as a leader, as a prophet, and them as a part of his congregation ﷺ. To take those a hadith and then use them and then use them as evidence to say, well, he said this alayhi salatu wasalam too. Yeah, he said it to them. He didn't say it to you. He didn't say it to you. You were not a part of this conversation at all. Why are you using a piece of information that you were not meant to hear in the first place? You heard, that's fine, but you don't get to use it. So all the hadith that have, is, this is ta'at is zawj and ta'at, this is something that women will listen to from the mouth of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam amongst themselves. It's not something that the husband gets to use as leverage and vice versa. And vice versa, the things the Prophet ﷺ told, told men is also, well, 
not all of them. Some of them, actually, when you look at the public addresses, you know, when the public, uh, Prophet Ali uh, talked to about gender issues publicly, he, he, he almost never addressed women. He always addressed men. It was also a stelso bin, always a stelso bin nisa, or et cetera, et cetera. It was always addressing men. And this is important to understand, like as a side note, that the Prophet ﷺ would have secluded uh, meetings with, with the Sahaba, sah you know, men and Sahabiyat, women, and, and he would give them advice, alayhi salatu wasalam. To take that advice and then use it as public statements is, is a little bit of a problem. The Quran, you can do that. The Quran is addressing everyone, and you can read the Quran that way, and everything in the Quran is, is, is public access. But when it comes to the Prophet ﷺ's teachings, we have to know the context for what he was teaching and how he was teaching, alayhi salatu wasalam. So understanding hijab here, because we've reduced it to something that is you know, very specific to, to sisters, it's a piece of cloth on their head, men have been secluded or excluded from this, from this uh, discussion altogether, which leads to all the problems that we have. A lot of the problems that we have come from how young men behave around women, how they view you know, the, the women around them, and how they end up seeing themselves in, you know, in, in conjuncture to, uh, to, to sisters. The same problem also will affect sisters because if it's reduced to a piece of cloth on the head, then the rest of herself, the rest of her, her dress code, and the rest of her behavior will not reflect what ifa and hijab actually is. And then we end up with a useless cloth. Like it actually, actually, it actually backfires. It backfires. It looks pretty, it looks bad. Like this is not, because when you're wearing, when a sister decides to wear the hijab, she's accepting on herself a social system. She's accepting on herself a, a, way, a way of life, a way of behavior a way that she's going to carry herself in the community, a way she's going to be dealing with others, as men do as well. And I think this is important. I don't know exactly, I, I'm not going to act like I, I, fi I figured out how to fix this problem within a community. Not at all. It's, it's actually quite complicated. It's very difficult, as human relationships have always been quite complicated and quite difficult. And it's the, you know, the, the gift that never stops giving, right? Uh, uh, human relationships and the, all the problems that come from it, it never ends. It just never ends. So it's not easy to deal with, but I don't think we're even trying. Like, I believe in our communities, we're not even trying to do it. Like, most massages don't accept this setup at all, by the way. Like, not even close. Then uh, go to any, the massages don't accept this setup. It has to be, you know, the women have to wave, it has to be a big barrier, a completely different entry, so that there's no possibility that there's any overlap between men and women. That, in my opinion, is a way for you to run away from a problem. It's just, it's just instead of dealing with something, you're just running away from it. I don't, it, you know, when men and women deal with one another, it brings a lot of headaches. I don't want headaches, so I'll just completely seclude them so they never deal with each other. But then what happens outside? Again, you don't, you're not seeing, you know, any, this masjid as a training ground. Like, you're not seeing masjid messages aren't being seen for what they are. It's where people come and learn how to actually carry themselves, how to deal with, uh, you know, you know, with certain situations in, in their lives. And if they don't learn here, then they're going to learn somewhere else. And the somewhere else they're going to learn is not going to teach them the same values that Islam is going to offer them. It's going to be a completely different value set altogether. And a different value set will later on, obviously, reflect within the masjid later. Like it will come back. It's just a matter of time. It's like instead of, it's, you're kicking the can down the, down the curb, that's all. It's kicking the can down the road. You want to deal with it. You'll, you'll have to deal with it tenfold a few years down the road when, when you didn't take time to train your young men or your young women in terms of how they're supposed to deal with one another so they can exist in the same space in a respectful manner without having problems, knowing that by, by doing that, you're going to subject yourself to a lot of problems. And we have, for the last two years, we have subjected ourselves to a large amount. Like a, there's a truckload of headache that I did not see coming in the, you know, in the periphery when I started this place. There's a couple of them. Like, and I was looking at starting a, a center. I had in my mind, okay, here are the problems that I'm have to deal with. I was focused on them. Then a truckload of headaches came that I didn't even know was coming from the periphery that later, literally threw us off balance completely. But does that mean that we, we st no, it doesn't mean we stop or change. It just means we have to adjust and learn how to do it. But it, it taught me, you know, it, it, it led for, to this lecture or to, the, or to this uh, series of, of khutbahs that I gave during the summer that talked about you know, gender relationships is that we have a problem within our community in terms of how we are preparing our youth to, to, you know, in, in the method they're going to carry themselves at school, at work, in university, around you know, the opposite gender, how they should behave, how they should think, and how they should speak. And a lot of it is just not clear, unfortunately, for, for a lot of our youth. And it brings me to an Islamic ethic. I mean, if if that is the umbrella concept or value, haya is the, is, the, is the ethic that we should understand. And again, haya is an ethic. When I ask you to, to translate it, you're going to tell me modesty. And that has nothing to do with the word. Like the root of the word uh, has, there's no way for modesty to exist in the root of this word at all. Like, like at all. Like it's not even a part of the, of the, of the concept. Now I'm going to show you how we ended up at modesty because I'm not saying that modesty is not a part of what haya is. I'm just saying that that's not really what the word meant to begin with. The word is much more meaningful and much more profound than that. 
Haya comes from the root of hayat, which is life, right? From, from hay, from something that is alive. In Arabic, whenever you add an alif and hamza at the end of something, you make it the epitome of that, uh, of that word. So something, for example, sama, you go up. So if you want the highest thing up, you say sama, which is why it's called, uh, why it's called the, uh, 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 the sky. So dur, for example, is, is harm. You want the epitome of dur, darra. بأس, بأس, and and, and yeah, you, you, you get the idea. So when you take the word hay uh, and you want to take the, uh, the epitome of, of, of meanings that this word can carry or the pinnacle of this word, what does this word actually represent in it? Then you say haya. Uh, so, so haya is the epitome of living, of being alive. Now, what aspect of life are we talking about? Well, something, something that's alive versus something that is, that is dead. What's the basic difference? Is there ability to respond? There's sensitivity. A, de a corpse no matter how many times you poke it, or it's not, it's not going to react because it doesn't feel anything. It's lost feeling. It doesn't feel, right? A, a, the way you know something's alive, if, it's, if it feels. Now, as a physician, when I'm going in to assess a patient that is not responsive to a, to a nurse, there's a few maneuvers that I have to do. One of the new maneuvers is called a sternal rub. Now, this is, and this is not, yeah, it, when you read it, it's like this is, this is a form of torture. This is called a sternal rub. I take my fist, I put it right in their chest, and I push down and I go like this. Now, to see if they'll respond in pain, because that's the only way for me to know if they're dead or alive. If they don't respond in pain from a sternal rub, then I have an assessment that I say, this is a code, you need to call a code right now, this person is either dead or dying, because they didn't respond to one of the most yeah, painful maneuvers that you can give a, another person. So the way we understand life is the ability, the is sensitivity, is it's being sensitive, is it's having feeling. Right? So haya is having the highest degree of sensitivity, of feelings. You feel, you feel everything around you, you're sensitive to everything that's occurring. That's what haya means. It's not being bashful. Another horrible reduction of the meaning of this word. That's khajal. Being bashful is khajal. Some people are like that. Some people are introverts. Some people are just not any confident socially. Some people just you know, have that. They have khajal. They're just shy. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Is it celebrated? Neither, neither celebrated nor not. It's not something that we really assign, assign good or, or you know, thumbs up or thumbs down to. It's just some people are bashful. They're shy. They have khajal. It's not something that, you know, that we... That, no, haya is sensitivity, is when you're aware of your surroundings. You're aware of how you are affecting others. That's what haya is, is you're aware of how you affect other individuals and how you affect the community that you're living in. That's what haya means. I'm watching out how I, how, what I say, how I behave, the way I dress, the way I walk, the way I talk, the way I speak, where I go. What I'm doing, I'm, I'm sensitive to how people are and how they are viewing it and how they're taking it and how they're, whether they're benefiting or, or being harmed, whether this is, this is causing difficulty for them or ease. I'm sensitive to these things. That's what hayat means. I'm not saying I, I'm just saying that that's what hayat yani actually uh, uh, means. So we took from that that if you're sensitive in that way, if you have that hayat where you're sensitive and you're like, well, the way I dress matters too then. You know, the way I'm going to present myself to the community, the way I'm going to sit, the way I'm going to speak, you know, the way, yeah, whether I have a smile on my face or not, the way I'm dressing, this is going to affect people. So it's going to affect people, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it. I'll make sure that I, that I, that I dress in a way that, that's appropriate. So that turns into modesty, which is why haya was turned into modesty. And you see, this is, how we, this is the thought process that we led to modesty. But then we got rid of the whole thing, and we just left with this one thing, which is modesty. You know, haya has no meaning to people anymore. And haya is your heightened sensitivity. Someone who walks into a place and is making sure that you know, their presence is, yeah, and is welcome, that they're not... Some people... I'll give you an example. And so you understand Alil al-Haya. So, you know, the word Alil al-Haya has no, has no Haya. And someone who comes and he, and he visits, a, a per, visits you and he sits for four hours. Now, four hours. After like half an hour, you, you're done. You've talked everything. You've been sitting there. You've been moving around. You've been picking up your phone. Your wife is calling you. And they're sitting there. No problem. Yeah, yeah, we'll have ghada, and then we'll, yeah, you've already had futur, we'll have ghada. There's no haya, there's no sensitivity. They don't feel that maybe, maybe you have something to do. You're too, you have haya. You're not going to come and say, bro, get lost. I have, I have, a, I have things to do. You're not going to do that because you're sensitive to their feelings. So you don't want to, so you want to harm them. But they don't have haya, so they'll just sit there going on and on and on. That's what haya is, is that you're, you're aware. Oh, I may be, I may be, I may be bothering you. I may be coming in a, you know, uh, Inappropriate time. Maybe I, you know, I, this is, may not be the best moment for you. I, did I overstay my welcome? Did I say something that was offensive? Did I, be, you know, uh, deal with you or, or, or treat you in a way that was not appropriate to you? That's haya. But, it, but so if you expand that concept, well, even the way that I dress, and the, even the way that I, I, I carry myself and I deal with, uh, with, 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 with others, that's a part of haya because I'm going to be watching out for myself. How is this uh, being carried? How is, how is this being taken by the people around me? So it's a heightened level of sensitivity.
So it's a beautiful, beautiful ethic. It's beautiful. Like it's, a, it's actually, you know, the Prophet alayhi salam, like this is just one hadith. Haya ulayati illa bi khair. Haya only brings khair. If you have haya, that only brings you khair. Sayyidina Uthman kana rajulan hayyan. He was a person who had a lot of haya. The malaika kana tastahi minhu. The malaika felt yani, uh, yani haya around him because he was such a, of, of such high caliber in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the malaika uh, tastahi minhu. It wasn't that he was bashful and shy. He led, he led the ummah, Ali radiallahu anhu, for, for a decade. He, he led the ummah. He was very brave, actually. He, he accepted death upon himself to save, to, you know, to, 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 you know, to make sure there was no bloodshed within his own... Uh, you know, so he wasn't someone who was weak or someone who lacked the ability to speak for himself. No, he just had haya. He was someone who was always sensitive. He was always thinking about others. Right? He was always thinking about how what, his behavior and what he was doing was affecting other people. Which is why the Prophet ﷺ, he would say, لِكُلِّ دِينٍ خُلُقْ وَخُلُقُ الْإِسْلَامِ الْحَيَةِ Every deen has, a, has an ethic that represents it. Like, you have all these beautiful ethics and you need one to kind of lead the way. وَخُلُقُ الْإِسْلَامِ الْحَيَةِ And the ethic of Islam is haya. That's, that's how you define us as Muslims. We're people, we're supposed to be at least, who are, who are highly sensitive to everyone around us. So you wouldn't park in a place that would, you know, cut off others from entering or leaving. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't walk into a bathroom and leave it as if yani, uh, something exploded in there. And you, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't do that. We don't walk into, we don't walk and you know put our feet beside people's faces because we want to sit a little bit uh, up front, even though we came late. We wouldn't do that because hayat wouldn't allow you to do it because it's, you're going you're gonna to bother people. You're going you're gonna to inconvenience them, make them feel yani, uh, it's not nice. So you wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do that. As Muslims, we would never do that. You would never, you know, rush towards the door, pushing and shoving to get out of Jum'ah or get in because we, you know, we, we believe that our lives are much more important than everyone else's and what we have to do next is actually more valuable than whatever what everyone else has to do next. And they just don't know that because I'm just more important, so I push myself. We wouldn't do that. That hayat wouldn't allow that. See, that's our deen. Our deen, the khuluq is al hayat. The Prophet ﷺ was like that. Kana ashad the hayat min al adra fi khidriha. Ali had more yani, hayat than, uh, the, the, than a young lady who, who was not married yet, who was being asked for, for marriage. The, the, the amount of sensitivity that she has at that moment. The Prophet ﷺ, this is how he lived his life. He was always wondering, you know, always attentive to his, the effect he had on people in, in the way that he, he carried himself and the way he lived his life. I'm just trying to make a point for you of how, 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 how profound these concepts are and how, how you know, they're not, they, don't, they don't carry that anymore. So a piece of cloth versus a social system. A social system where when I, when I look at my, 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 did I talk about, uh, yes, so when I look at, when I look at the, the opposite gender, I'm not focusing on, on appearance, I focus on merit. The, way, the reason that we dress and the way, is that it forces people not to focus on the way you look. It, it focuses on the things that you have to say, who you are, your character. Now, when, 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 this is the concept that, that, that this social system brings forward. When you dress with haya, when, you, when this risk when this ifa exists, when this ifa exists, when you're not looking at the opposite gender and you're, think, you're thinking about something that is materialistic, when you're not focusing on their appearance, then you have to listen to what they have to say. And that values the person instead of valuing something that really does not, the, most, for the most part, is not something that they had control over to begin with. And your appearance or the way you look is not always something that you can, uh, yeah, you, you can change. And that's not real value. And if you're being valued because of an appearance, then how real is that? And that doesn't, that doesn't stay around for very long. And, and, it, and it's very... It's, it's, it's worthless, really. It's really worthless. Yeah, I mean, youth only sticks around for a couple of, right, two decades, and then it's gone. Yeah, for men and women, by the way, it doesn't, you know, it's not just for ladies, it's for both. But when, when there's this social system that... that dip, that dictates that we don't see people based on their appearance. We don't look, we're not focused on their appearance. We're looking at merit. We're listening to what they have to say. We are seeing how, what their character looks like. It's a whole different, it's a whole different yeah, method of life. Acknowledging human nature. And we can't talk about this anymore. I even, I even feel very, very uncomfortable talking about this. We can't talk about human nature anymore. It's like it doesn't exist. It's like it's not a part of life anymore. That yeah, men are a certain way and women are a certain way. And we, we view ourselves in a certain way. We view the opposite gender in a certain way. Wallahi, I never thought that was going to come to a point where we couldn't, but we can't talk about this. Khalas. It's not. We have to ignore all human nature. We have to ignore that men are extremely, extremely attracted to the visual. That men are extremely attracted to the visual. And that women are extremely attracted to, the, to, the, to, to what they hear, to the audible. And that, there's, and that yeah, I mean, men love to, to, to give attention and women love to seek it. This is a part of human nature. It's a part of how we are as, as individuals. It's the biology, yeah, Sheikh, is the, is, the, is the basics of our psychology. But, but the way that we're living right now is that we're, we're, we're saying, no, that's not the case. We're all exactly, we're not all the same when it comes to that. We never were and we never will be. And actually ignoring that piece makes it impossible for us to function as societies. Islam just acknowledges that, yeah, this is your nature. 
This is human nature, so this is how you're going to you know, deal with one another. This is, how, this is how we're going to organize your society for you so that you're, everyone's protected, so that everyone can, can live in a safe space where they're not, where, where men are not always fighting off an urge because of, of something, and women are not always being hounded and being followed and, and, and having to deal with comments and having to deal with, with, with people staring, because that's not comfortable for either gender. To, it's not comfortable for either group. And when you have that system, then those who make mistakes will become clear. When a guy is qalil adab, qalil haya, lacks, of, lacks haya, it becomes very clear because the system is set up where someone who says something that's inappropriate, behaves in a way that's inappropriate, is ob it's obvious, it stands out, and that person can be removed, reprimanded, or punished. And same goes for the, other, for the opposite gender. And this is how we're supposed to function as a society. It's designed to protect us. How do we, if we don't have that, then how do we open masajid and have youth safely come in? If, you, if you're young, you, you, this may not make as much sense to you, but once you have a kid, you'll understand. Once you have a 14-year-old son or a 14-year-old daughter, uh, and you send them to a masjid and they come back with a relationship that was, that, that, that they, <laughs> you didn't send them to come back with a relationship, you sent them so they could learn them some Islam and build some friendships, but you send them to a masjid, they came back with a relationship. Now they know somebody and they know someone else and someone's texting back and forth and there's interest and they're only 14 years old so they can't get married and now you're stuck with this problem and if you tell them that you don't like it, then they're going to, they're teenagers who are, you know, with raging hormones uh, all day long so they don't really have a lot of reason and no matter how much you talk to them about this issue, they won't listen to you. It was the fault of the masjid that did not have the proper setup. It's the fault of the Muslim community that did not make sure that it was a safe place where they both they could both come here and they could exist. The opposite gender is there. We're not. I don't believe in segregation of. Uh, that's not how he lived. Alayhi salatu wasam. His masjid was like this, almost exactly this size, by the way, just as a uh, yani, almost exactly this size. No, 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 nothing bigger than this, exactly like this, with no yani, with a few pillars. Uh, there was no there was no saqf up front. He would stand and pray, pray alayhi even though that because at the beginning they put the uh, saqf towards uh, Masjid al Aqsa, right? Because they were praying to the, you know, they were praying towards Al Aqsa, but then uh, the Qibla turned back to Mecca, so the, 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 they roofed one part of the Masjid and left the other part unroofed. They left the part that was towards Mecca unroofed and the words towards Aqsa roofed because that's where they pray. So we ended up praying where it's unroofed. And then, you know, out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, see it, Ahl al Sufa lived under the roof piece, which, which worked out for them. Uh, so that was his Masjid, it was open, wasn't even on a roof. Men prayed up front, women prayed behind because they didn't uh, because it was dark and there was uh, there was no electricity and there was no, people didn't have cars. After Salat al Isha, men had to stay until the women yani, got up, took their children, and went home. And when they got safely home, then men left so that they wouldn't have ikhtilat in, 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 in closed in, in, in dark alleys with no yani, with, with no way to distinguish who the person is in front of you because it's so dark. If you think back then, there was no yani, lamps or or yani, b b Fuel-based lamps were very few. Like the Siraj in the Masjid was very, you only had two or three in the, in the Masjid and then in the, in the rest of uh, yani, the city that didn't really, didn't really exist. So that's why people die, sleep. Yani, uh, if you, uh, I live in a village yani, for most of my life and, and, and the last two years yani, before I left, uh, electricity was what, maybe four hours a day or three hours a day or something. It was ridiculous. You just, you had everything in the, <laughs> the, the charger, laptop and charger. Uh, so at seven, uh, once Maghrib Adhan went off and you prayed, you actually struggled to make it to Aisha. Like you struggle to make it, you couldn't make it to Aisha, like I, because there's no electricity, yeah, and it's very inviting just to sleep. So you would make it to Aisha, and then you would bolt home and just collapse and sleep. Probably the best year of my life. Yeah, you just you, let, you slept nice and early. Woke up. Well, don't say nothing. You open this place and then you go sleep at seven o'clock. Well, I I don't know. <laughs> Leaving me in the dragon's den. <laughs> No, I agree. Uh, Brother Khalid's system of life is, is better. We don't have, I don't know that we have the ability to, you know, to function like that here. I wish we did. I wish that uh, you know, days ended earlier and we started earlier. You know, honestly, I, I brought this to my division at the hospital that starting at 9, no, no, either start at 7 or 11. You know, 9 is horrible. Fajr is like 5.30 to 6 o'clock. Either I pray Fajr and I come and work or I need to go home and have a nice nap. Like I sleep for a good amount of time and I come. 9, I get neither. I can't start early. I can't start late. It just it's, it's like kills your day. And then you running. The Muslims, they yaqilun. They take naps. It's the shayateen that don't take naps. I have actually one of my staff. Uh, he's not Muslim, but a very religious man, very nice man. He, he, in his, he has in his uh, office a, a bed. Like a, a proper put up bed in and think at 12.30, once we're done the afternoon clinic, he goes upstairs and he sleeps for 30 minutes. He comes down to the afternoon clinic and his eyes are always bulging out of his face, but he had a nice nap. 
Yeah, isn't it? It's actually very valuable. You sleep less if you have a nap during the day. Like you sleep less, you don't need as much time. Anyways, this has nothing to do with this, but I thought I would bring it up. So when we talk about ifma, yani the, the, Muslim, the Muslim approach to this topic is that we, we, we refuse to focus on, on appearance. We acknowledge human nature, so we organize things acknowledging that yes, we have to dress in a certain way, we have to lower our gaze in a certain way, we have to speak to each other in a certain way, because human nature is there, it'll never go away, and both, of our, and both genders will seek certain things, and if we don't have boundaries, then those things will be sought too early, in the wrong time, and it'll cause problems for everybody. And if they learn how to, you're not on the market, you're not on the market. It's not your time. If you're looking for a marriage, you look for marriage, and you like someone, then you go ask, and if not where, you move on to the next person. Same thing for ladies. It's very simple, you're not ready yet, then you don't, you're not, you don't open, for, you have to be, you have to have those, uh, I know, forgive me for this phrase. Forgive me for the phrase. But I want you to think about this phrase. This is a really weird phrase. I, I find it really weird. Well, it's, it's a, it's, it's a mind-blowing phrase that now has become normal. We just say, yeah, how are you? What does that mean to dress in this manner? Right? Let me, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you an example of what, I, what I'm trying to explain. I, I'll say this. Um, I dress respectfully. Right? Why? Because I want people to respect me. Right? If I dress like this, then I want people to what? Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Like when you, when you make that phrase, what are you trying to... Dressing like this, what does that mean? That I want people to look at me and... Ma'qul, that's what I want. I want people to look at me and have... A'udhu billah. Imagine that, you're walking down the street, you're hoping everyone who sees you hopes that they can... La ilaha illallah, what is, what is, what is, how does that even work? How does that work? Like how does that... How is that, an, how is that ethically sound? How, how does a community or society or a, or a civilization, how does it accept such, such phrases? And yeah, that's how I'm dressed. I'm dressed in a way where everyone who sees me wants to have sex with me. I want people to, to see me, respect, have, يعني, uh, يعني, have empathy, have compassion. That's, what, that's how you dress. You dress in a way I want people to, uh, to know who I am. I want to uh, express my values through the way I dress. What are my values? This is my value. My value I want people to see me and want to... This is what I'm trying to say. This is our problem. We, we've, we, we, don't un, we, we don't understand the, the, the danger of some of the phrases that we use because we've reduced our concept of hijab to something really simple. And just a claw. Men are completely excluded from this whole conversation. And sisters are just told you have to put a claw in your head. Claw in your head, claw in your head. Just cover your head. And then everything else doesn't matter. How you, you know, the rest of your dress code doesn't matter. The way you speak to people doesn't matter. The way you, uh, how, what your boundaries are with people doesn't matter. Nayami. No, if is much more profound than that. It's much more profound than that. It's, yeah, that professionalism you find. By the way, like our ifa is 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 uh, is uh, expressed very well in workspaces. Today, maybe it wasn't maybe in the sixties and seventies, you know, to lack of uh, you know, good regulations. But today, for the most part, uh, at least maybe in, you know, in public sectors or in hospitals where I work, there's there's a there's a you know, there's a code of prof professionalism. You can't you can't speak inappropriately. You can't be inappropriate. You can't dress inappropriately. You have to come in a certain a certain dress code that's needed. Like we are more professional and you have more ifa in in, in any hospitals for those who want than than we have maybe sometimes in masajid. Yeah, unfortunately, because we don't have that proper yani, mentality. Ifa it's a it's fikri. It's a mentality of chastity. It's not just there's a, there's a there's a way of thought that's that that yeah, uh, uh, that's just included in um, in understanding what what chastity actually is. And I think we have to take some time and reflect on this so that we, we go from this very reduced concept to, to, to the beauty and the profoundness of what it, what it once was. So you, so you can, because you want to be able to trust your children. You want to be able to have confidence that they will, they know how to carry themselves. They know how to draw boundaries. They know how to speak to other people. They, they have if. They're not, you know, they're not going to be, they're not, gonna, they're not vulnerable. See, see, parents who don't have trust in their children will deprive them from a lot. Like I get a lot of uh, you know, high, high school students and university students, right? They don't let me do this. They don't let me do this. I can't go there. I can't do this. I'm like, yeah, the problem is probably they just don't have trust. No, I don't know if they should or they shouldn't because I don't know you well enough to actually make that judgment. I, I, I don't know, but that's probably the reason. And I'm not saying that it's okay. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that that's the, that's the problem, and that there's lack of trust. And that lack of trust comes from the fact that if, as a, as, a, as a mentality, as a value, as a concept, was not properly discussed. Because there's, there's a lot to discuss regarding it. Like this discussion, I'm, I actually, I just scratched the surface of what needs to be talked about. Like we need to talk about way more things. And it has to be gender specific. Meaning, you have, some of these parts of these discussions have to be gender but You have to sit down and talk to Shabab differently than you maybe talk to, to Sabaya. The objective is one, but the, the nature of it is going to be a little bit different in terms of what is required of them, um, in terms of how they should view themselves uh, within, within the community they're living in. Let's talk about love. The second piece. Love versus lust. I don't think we know the difference. I don't think as, as the human race, we know the difference between the two things. And I think we confuse them. Love is a very difficult concept to define, by the way. 
And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but it's an extremely profound value. It's a concept that Islam is built upon. Islam is built upon love. This is what I was taught. You know, you know, I mean, someone today brought up to me that, you know, oh, we talk about love a lot in the West because we're all, you know, lovey-dovey. No, I learned love in the Middle East. I didn't learn it here. I, I did not learn it here. I learned, I learned the concept of love back home from the teachers who taught me fisham, you know, under, under, under siege and under bombing. And these are the people who taught me, who showed me how the Quran speaks about this, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wadud. And they explained, me, explained to me the importance of having love within Islam. And without it, Islam does not survive. It's there for a while. You can discipline yourself for a couple of years. Then if you lack love, it all goes downhill from there. And it turns into these reduced concepts. Actually, the argument that I, when I had, when I, when I prepared this, uh, you know, this talk, or I prepared this topic, and I prepared this topic maybe, maybe five or four or five years ago or more, um, uh, probably more than that. And, and, I, and I, I, at the time, I, I had a discussion with my shuk. I, I asked him, like, you know, where do you think, like, I was, I was interested to see, remember the first um, uh, uh, lecture that we had, and I kind of went over with the psychologists and so sociologists who are not religious necessarily, kind of looked at things and, and how they assess stuff. I asked him, what is your assessment? Why do you think, you know, we are at that point where ikhtizal al-qiyam, ikhtizal al-qiyam, reducing values, reduction of values is something that they're, فَقَالَ هُوَ فَقْدَانُ الْحُبْ It's the lack of love. Because when you do something just based on discipline for a long time, and it doesn't end up fulfilling its purpose, and it's not later on derived by love, it gets reduced to something that's very mechanical because you, you, that's the only way for you to deal with it. Because you run into something called cognitive dissonance, where, where this, you're doing it, it doesn't make any sense. Either you get rid of it, nah, or you do it in a way that doesn't mean anything, just so you can keep it and you can, your conscience doesn't feel bad, right? Because if it, do, if it doesn't work, the way it's going to work is that if, if, it's, if it's driven by love. You can only drive behaviors via fear, desire and discipline for so long. You can only drive behavior via these three yani, motivations for a certain period of time. They're short-term, they're amazing short-term. Yani, fear is an amazing short-term, immediate, yani, uh, immediate relief type of, uh, of, uh, yani, <laughs> uh, of motivation. Like if you're in the middle, in the middle of a, in front of a masiyah, yani, or you, you, you need fear to say, nope, I'm not doing this, I'm not gonna be punished for this. It's like that yeah, immediate relief Tylenol pill that you take to get rid of the headache. But it doesn't work in the long run. In the long run, you have to figure out something else. Same thing goes for desire. Desire, yani, uh, the raghba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a reward. It, it works, it, 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 it sparks things, it starts the engine moving. But then after a while, you, you start, if, if you start to mature mentally and intellectually, you start to feel that, I don't want to be just looking at materialistic gain. I don't want that to be the only reason I have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start to outgrow it. So if you don't outgrow these things to a long-term motivation, which is love, the long-term motive, the best motive, the most powerful of all motives, by far the endless energy resource for, for having, for being, a Muslim is love. And if it doesn't exist, then you, you lose a lot. So that's just yani, my rant on this issue from an Islamic perspective. However, when it comes to how we define it, we often Mix love up with lust. Lust is different. It's important. Without it, life can be quite boring. It's required within you know, uh, certain types of relationships. Within certain relationships, you need lust. If you remove lust altogether, then it becomes very hard. Without that chemistry, any you know, spouses, you know, a marriage does not you know, survive. Marriages become very rocky and difficult because you need that peace there. It's how marriages start. You have to be able to, to, to generate a certain way of, of, a certain way of, of feeling towards someone else in order for you to fathom or imagine that maybe this could be a long-term relationship that will work forever. So if so, if so, and I tell guys, sometimes like my ummi tukhtubli fulana, she wants to get, and I look at her, I, 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 I'm not, yeah, then don't. Yeah, it's haram, it's not fair for her. Like she's a human being. If she, she doesn't want to be in a relationship with the guy that does not think she's attractive at all to him, it's not about you. Again, this comes from the lack of these conversations with men. Men think it's all about them. I don't feel attractive, so I'll marry her. What, 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 do you, what about, uh, is that not a person? Does that person not deserve to be in a relationship where they feel that, that their spouse is attracted to them? Why is it always about you? But again, that comes from the lack of understanding. Of if, and this whole concept, men aren't educated on this issue appropriately. The way the, way the, the Prophet ﷺ would tell the Sahaba, go, before you do, so go take a look. Make sure that this person in the umbur, فَإِنَّ فِي أَعْيُنِ الْأَنصَارِ شَيْئًا That we told him Mas'ud. And you go look, sometimes the, the eyes of the, of the people of the people of Medina are different than the eyes of the people of Mecca. They don't look the same. They look a little bit different. So maybe before you go take a look, make sure that this is something you, you, you can, because it's not fair to her. It's not just not fair to you, it's not fair to her either. So lust is important. But for lust to, 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 to substitute love, uh, to substitute it, where, when we say love, all we think about is sexual chemistry and attraction between two, two people. Yeah, then we, we, we're, not, we're not defining this appropriately. And this won't, it's not a long-term, yeah, it, 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 it's not going to work long run. 
Like for the long, and that's why you, the, the most amazing love stories in history, they always, end with the, you know, they always end these stories at the moment they get married, right? That's every, every rom-com in the history of uh, all these novels. They end when they're standing at the altar. Tell, tell the story, just, just jump forward, show me 15 years later, all right? If 15 years later they still love each other, then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say this is a good love story. But it's never like that. It actually turns into one of the most, you know, the, the, the worst Divorces in the history of divorce, it's a bloodbath and people, have, what, what point was that love, what value did that love have? And at the end, this is what you're doing to the other person. There was no love, there was no love. فَسَرِّحُهُنَّ سَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا تَسْرِيحُ When you're going to, when the divorce has to be سَرَاحًا جَمِيلًا It has to be with beauty, it has to be beautified. We didn't get along. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you the best. Inshallah, you do really well. And inshallah, you're able to take care of yani, yourself and uh, on your way. Does, divorces should not end in the amount of hatred that they end in today. Like, they really shouldn't. I understand some of it will happen when there's abuse, when there's mistreatment, and there's domestic violence. That's different. I'm not talking about these, these cases that are, yani, but there's dhulm in them. I'm talking about generally speaking, people don't get along. They don't get along. It's normal. You don't get along. It's not a problem. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not helping each other. Like, I'm not helping you be better. You're not helping me be, be better. We're actually harming one another. We, we, part, we part ways in a way that is beautified. Yeah, because, because there was love. If there's true love, and... and Again, you say, well, no, there's, you can only love one person. You start loving, nah, who said, you know, you love one who, who said this? Here's like five, five things we're going to talk about. Let's start with the first one, the myth of the one. What do you mean, the one? you can't love one person? Are you insane? What do you mean you can love one? You, you, you love millions of people. Like, you, you will love a lot in your life, and you will love many people. And the concept that, no, I can only fall in love with one person one time in my life, that was made up. That was made up by, by yani, I, want, I don't want to... I'm going to come off as you know, a conspiracy theorist by saying, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say all this. Look, the people who came up with this, they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were selling. They knew what they were selling by saying that. That there was one person for you in the world. BS. Huh? Openly. They, they, no, that's completely untrue. What do you mean there's only one person for you? Imagine that. Eight billion people. There's one person. How are you going to find this person? Like, how are you, Imagine eight billion people. The odds are they're in China. Yeah, the odds are pretty high that they're in China because that's where the most people are. How, it makes no sense there's one person. That's not true. What do you mean there's one person? There's actually like 90% of humanity you're able to actually build a loving relationship with. It's actually the opposite. Maybe there's one or two people that you can't, that you can't, you can't stomach, you can't take care of. It's impossible. There's, no, there's just no attraction whatsoever and you're so different that you can't do it. But the majority of human beings, we, we're, we're programmed to be able to love one another. Imagine if love was that scarce and that rare. What a sad existence we must have if, if, if you can only love one person. If, no, you'll love many. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. Like when, when spouses are sitting there and, and, and the husband or the wife are, are yeah, and jealous because, and we're not talking about someone else, like a, a previous, no, because he loves his mom a lot or she loves her uncle a lot or her brother a lot. It's, it's pathetic. That shows a level of insecurity in who you are as a person that you should address. Forget about the, your spouse. What do you mean you're, you're, you're jealous of how much she loves her mother or her, or her father or her, or her brother? She, she's going to love many people. She's going to love her children and love her friends. And she's going to love a lot, so, just like you are. Wives, for example, that are upset that the, the, her, her, son, this, you know, her husband loves his mother a lot. Why are you upset of why? What, what do you think? Why are you, th why are you, why are you seeing you see this as competition if you understand this, uh, you know, th th this garbage? One, it's not how it is. It's not the same. It's not, this, it's not even similar. You're saying that the love a, a, a man has to his mother is <laughs> the same, of, in, same in nature that the love he has to his wife? Yes, yeah, that's, that's disgusting. They even think that way. That's, it's, not, it's love, but it's not the same type of love. Come on. Like, you have to be, it's, it's because we've been led to believe. We've taken this word, this amazing word. The central word in our deen, the central world, word in life, in life, and we've reduced it to something that is very, very mechanical, and is very, and is not, and, and does not last, and is and hormonal in, in, in nature, and it's just, it's just, it's, it's chemical, it's chemical. That's what it is, and we reduce this amazing concept, and we've, we've basically emptied, emptied our, our hearts of it, and emptied our deen of it. So it reduces something very sexual these days. That's how it's always looked at. It's talked about in, that, in those terms. Love is, uh, you know, they even use that to, to describe it. It's, you know, it's very problematic for love to be reduced to a sexual act or some form of sexuality. That's basically, I remember, I remember this story. And my mom probably remembers this. But my grandma came and visited us in the 90s in, in, our, in our village. And we were, I, she was just coming, we were just in the, in the car. And there was two guys and this is, this, is, this is very normal, by the way. I did this all my life. Two guys walking down the street holding hands. 
yeah, holding hands. So she saw that and he said, oh, you guys have this problem here too. He was like, no, no, we don't. No, I, I, hold, I held my friend's hands all my life. Huh? I loved them and they loved me and we held hands and there's nothing weird about it. Yeah? But see, even you're like, oh, oh, <laughs> sheikh, no. See, even you're like, because we, we've been programmed and this, we've been programmed to think, oh, there must be something. No, there isn't. But you, if you take love and you reduce it to lust, then yeah, that's what it seems, that there must be something, some suppressed urge. There was no suppressed urge at all. It was, it's disgusting to even think of it. But it's love. I, we would hope, I remember, like, all throughout grade 9, 10, in university, this was a, it only became abnormal when I came here. Like it only became abnormal when I actually came here and I saw how people function. Go back to the Middle East, you find you know, people, uh, you know, the pinky thing. <laughs> I've seen guys pinky. Well, it, it's, it's very normal. It's an expression of love. They're, they're best friends. They love each other. There's no lust involved at all. At all. And it's, it's completely normal. But again, we've reduced this concept to something very, very simple. And you're saying, my pro this, is my, this is a problem. This is a real problem. This has to be addressed. We have to talk about this more. It's very uncomfortable, by the way, to talk about, especially here in the West, because we've been the way we've been pre-programmed to see things and accept things, and the and the premise for the discussion. Like I said at the beginning of this course, uh, the the limitations of this of, of acceptable opinion has been set for us. We can't talk outside of it anymore. And because because they've made love, love reduced to lust, when men feel that way towards each other, they start wondering: Does that mean we? Do we actually, have, maybe that, that's what it seems everyone's saying. No, no, you love each other and there's no, <laughs> it doesn't have to be that, but that's what they're saying. If we love each other, we must be, that must, that, that every love has to mean something sexual. A'udhu billah, a'udhu billah. Again, if you read, mod, if you read yani, Western uh, yani, uh, uh, novels and, and Western literature, you'll find that there's a lot of stuff like, stuff like that. There's a lot of incest, right? A lot of incest, and it's becoming actually more and more prevalent and, you know, very well-known shows and things that the, have a lot of incest in it. it it's, 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 it's quite uh, disturbing. It's very disturbing that this is where we're allowing you know, the, our, our minds and our, and our souls to go. It's reduced to fish love. You know what fish love is? If I ask you, uh, I, you tell me, hey, Sheikh, I love fish. Oh, you love fish. So you take it out of its natural habitat, you chop its head off, you throw it into a pan, and then you eat it. That's what you do to things you love. Huh? So a lot of love is reduced to fish love. Think about that. You say, I love my mom. Is it fish love or is it actual love? Where you just love what they do for you. You just love that they, they do something for you. They, take, they, they give you something that you want. Because fish love is, is not real love. And it means nothing, really. And it's actually quite pathetic to exist as an alternative for real love. When you only love that which does something for you. That which gives you, uh, fulfills a need or offers you yani, b b something that you require. And you love it because it does that for you. What happens when it stops doing that for you? What happens when, that's why the, you know, the Birr al-Walidin is talked about in the Quran. To, uh, to prevent this problem. Because at a certain point, your parents won't have anything left to give. There was a, a book when I was a kid, remember? The Giving Tree? It was my favorite book. A tree that just, you know, as it grew up, as, as the boy would grow up, every time he needed, he needed money, she would give the, uh, the apples. If, it had, you know, if he needed a house, she would give the branches. If he needed, until there's nothing left of the tree at the end of his life. And he went and he sat on the stump. And, you know, it was a beautiful story of something that just keeps on giving. But at some point, they won't have anything left to give you. So then what? I've seen, I've seen, I've heard and witnessed stuff that are just very sad. It's very sad when you sit there and you watch uh, you know, a, a, a son or a daughter just hoping that their parents would die. Just hoping that they would just move on because you know, they'd want to live their lives. This poor person who offered everything they had when they had to offer, had nothing left to offer and now they're, they're, they're disposable. You don't need them anymore. We don't want them around. That, it, I mean, a part of the beauty of the, Middle East, of, of the culture of Islam in the Middle East, at least maybe, I don't know if it's still there now, but when it was there, it was the ta'zim of the, of the kibar, of, of the magnification of respect the elders had, where they lived in the center of the home, where, where they were, you know, were taken care of by everyone, where everything still came to them, even though they could hardly move, even though they couldn't even stand up on their own, they needed help, but they were dignified. They were not thrown into a home. They were not spoken to in a, in a belittling manner, even if they lost their minds and were completely out of it and they, and they were completely demented. Fish love is a problem in our society where we only love that which does something for us. And yeah, get rid of that. That's not, that's not a healthy way. That's not real love. It's not real love. It's not actually what love is at all. It's reduced to an emotion. It's reduced to an emotion. Yes, it can be, it's reduced to an emotion. Because if it's, that's all it is, then I don't care what you have in your heart. I really don't. 
Like if you're like, I love you, I don't care. I, I, that, doesn't make, that, that doesn't help me. Uh, it, unless you have something to do about it, unless you're going to actually come and volunteer or you know, uh, you know, you're going to assist us or, or, or help with service, then your love me is meaningless to me. Like if you every day come say, well, Allah, Shaykh, I love you. I never, you're never a part of anything. It means nothing. It means nothing. It's, uh, yeah, you're saying it, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know that it's there. I have no evidence that it's there. Emotions are, you know, are for you. Emotions are for you to deal with. Emotions are your domain. That's what you deal with. Don't make it other people's problems. Huh? Just, 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 don't make your emotions other people's problems. And don't express something that you're not willing to prove because it, it, it comes off as dishonest, right? If I, uh, you love some... And this, and this, again, this comes down to a, another problem that we have in, in our society. When how we def and we'll talk about that in a moment. How we understand love and how we define it within our, within our households, between people. You know, men express love a little bit differently than women do. I'm not saying that they're right or wrong. It just happens a little bit differently. For men, their expression of love is a lifelong commitment to people where they'll put their wealth and their time and their effort and they'll grow old and they'll give everything they have and they'll die, making sure that these people are taken care of and have something to live by afterwards. That's how they express their love. Now, it may not be the most uh, any, uh, enjoyable expression of love, but it, is, but it is love all the same. And women express it very differently. Right? I don't know how exactly, but they do. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> You have to give me one or two jabs throughout this whole thing, or else I <laughs> allow me just one or two again, right? So I'll, 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 I'll behave afterwards and show. <laughs> yeah, no, no, she's watching right now, so she'll. Uh, I'll hear. I'll hear this when I go home. <laughs> yeah, the concept of love being conditional versus unconditional. This is a very. This is a very difficult topic. Um, the concept of condition, unconditional love. This, this, this disagreement on this topic, when you, when you say conditional and conditional, it comes from the definition. What do you mean by unconditional love? Are you talking about the emotion? That's ridiculous. If you're talking about the emotion, that's ridiculous because you can't, you can't hold me to an emotion. If I don't feel love anymore, I don't feel love. And if, uh, it, it, lo the emotion itself is very much conditional. Uh, it's very much, it, it has a lot of conditions you know, surrounding it. If, you're, if the person in front of you continues to abuse you all the time, then you're not going to feel that emotion anymore. So it's very much conditional. That's why our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be properly understood so that we may have unconditional love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He does with us. Because if we tie the occurrences, that ha the occurrences in our lives to His love subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we're, we're going to have a problem. If we, if we, if we uh, yani, um, tie in yani, the difficulties that we run into or the struggles that we have within our lives to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, then we're going to have a big problem. Because that's not how we're supposed to understand his love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, we're here right now. He's already shown us a, an, an infinite amount of love. Because going from nothing to something, there's no way, there's no way to value that, to, to, to market value that. There's no way to explain it, to what it's worth, and how, much, how many problems later on can cancel it out. Nothing can cancel that out. The fact that you sit here right now as a human being that's able to understand what I have to say, you've already been shown so much love that there's no way for that to be canceled out by, by, a, by, by a full lifetime of agony and suffering. Then they can't cancel it out. So your love for Allah will always be unconditional because of the fact of what he, do, he has done for you. And then your life, love for him has to be the same, of the same nature. But when it comes to people, it's different. You say unconditional love, what do you mean by that? I, want to love, I have to love my children unconditionally. Okay, let's say your child that somehow Allah grows up and they beat you every day. Then what? You love them unconditionally too? Are you talking about the emotion? Well, the emotion won't be there for sure. Then what are you talking about? The caregiving? Okay, well, what do you do when they start doing that? When you start being abused by that person? Are you understanding the problem? I'm not, I'm not offering you a... Uh, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just saying that this topic is, itself is, is overrated. And it's talked about in abstract ways, and there's no definition. And there's no clarity on what's meant. So the person doesn't know what to do. The person doesn't know when to let go, when to hold on, when to... They don't know how to deal with things. They don't know when the time is that I have to, you know, I have to let go because I have to preserve myself. I'm being abused, I'm being mistreated. It, the problem is, is real. But it all comes down to this. You know, all these questions all come down to how do you define love? When I go over, like a tez, my, in my Tazkiyah halakat, when I, it, it takes like a year and a half to talk about this topic. And it's talked about like four or five times because it takes a long time for people to fully wrap their heads around what love actually means. Because it's an abstract concept that even the scholars don't agree on the definition of. Even the scholars don't know exactly. It's such a precious thing that it's hard to figure out what exactly it is. Yeah. But for sure, it's not just an emotion. And for sure, it's not just something sexual. And for sure, to say it's conditional or unconditional it has to have parameters that are clear when we use that, that terminology. Or else we're, we're putting ourselves in harm's way. 
You love someone uh, to the point where you're willing to ruin your own life for them, even though they don't carry you in any regard at all. Think about that for a while. How is that? Is that, is that correct? Is that appropriate? You may say, yes, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And that's how I love this person. For sure, oh, that's fine. But why would that be the case? Why would you be willing to ruin your akhirah, for example? For, would you be willing to, to do that? You know, this, this, the, the, the story of Abdullah ibn Haram and his son Jabir, when they were going out for Uhud and they, yani they, uh, they, they, they threw a coin or drew a straw because Jabir is like, I'm, I'm 20, I'm going. You're like 85. You have all these daughters. I, you know, you stay. I, you're old. You're elder. You don't have to go. And you have like, your daughters. And I'm, I'm young. I, I, it makes sense. I go for this. You stay home. And he said, no. And then they drew straws. And it turned out uh, Abdullah was going to go. And the son was going to stay. So Jabir was very upset. He was, he was sobbing because he wasn't going to be with the, with the Sahaba. He wasn't going to be a part, part of this. If was anything aside from Jannah, I would have, I would have uh, yani, uh, given it to you. Like if it's anything aside from this, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Ya Fatim, I met the Muhammad, Salini, Min Mali, Ma Shiti, Huwalaki. Ask me whatever you want from everything that I own is yours. But you have to save yourself from the hellfire. That, that's on you. You have to do that, please. I can't do that for you. But in terms of what I have, I offer it to you. This is, yeah, yeah. So the concept of love, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to actually explain it here today because it's, it, 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 it requires a touching base on a number of other values and ethics so that we can tie them all together so that you can understand exactly how to view and understand it. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that don't accept the reduction of this value, of this extremely central part of our deen and of our lives to something that is, that is a slither of the, of the actual meaning itself. Make sure that you engage in, in deep thoughts and discussion and to, to comprehend what love is. And you'll find that there are all these different types of love. And it presents itself in all the different ways. There has to be evidence to it. There has to be a caregiving aspect to it. And yes, there may be an emotion to it. There may not be sometimes. But there's always that piece. And, and taking time to comprehend that I think is, is uh, of, of, of real importance. I'll end by talking, with gender, uh, uh, I'll end by talking about uh, gender issues. It, it's, it's becoming... I guess, I, guess, I guess growing up in a different part of the world, I never really imagined the extent of the conversation. Like I didn't, I didn't even though I, I, I considered myself like up to date to a certain degree with popular culture and what, what the West is saying, but I didn't, really, I didn't really get it until I came here. When I came here and I started hearing the actual arguments, people speaking their minds about what they, how they view these gender issues, meaning how we, you know, how we identify, um, how we, what type of relationships, the relationship between men and women cannot be reduced to something sexual all the time. It, can't, it shouldn't be looked at like that. That's very, that's very harmful for the, for the psyche. It's, har it's harmful for us as, as people. It's, if every time you're in the vicinity of a female that's not a mahram to you, you're thinking about the possibility of, of something that will lead to a sexual relationship, whether halal or haram, I'm not even, I'm not even caring about that piece, or vice versa. Uh, yani, uh, we, we, see, we see the opposite gender, oh, women see women only within that capacity. That becomes problematic. That actually hinders the ability for life to progress, it hinders our ability for creativity, for collaboration, for growth, for pre you know, we, we can't, we, you cannot achieve prosperity if, if that's how we are constantly seeing one another. And even if you're single and you're looking for marriage, that still wouldn't be healthy. But I'm seeing that even when it comes to people who are married, always viewing the opposite gender with the possibility of there being, no, relationships cannot, cannot be reduced, cannot be reduced just to something that is sexual in nature. Yeah. And even though there may be an urge that is pushing for that, you have to learn to, to deal with that. That's why these conversations have to occur with, at younger ages, that you have to understand that that's not how you're supposed to be functioning. Not every single person you come by, you have to, th no. Because the, the, I'll tell you, I, I can't speak for the female brain. I'll speak to the male brain. For the male brain, that is how the male brain functions. If you leave the male brain to do whatever it wants, the male brain will do that every encounter it has. Every time a man meets a woman, if he does not have the inhibitory uh, skills to actually deal with it, that's how he's going to think immediately. And it has nothing to do with his upbringing, it has nothing to do with the value system, it's just, just the sexual biology, uh, sexual psychology that men carry. No. But that has to be removed or changed or inhibited or dealt with based on Education. You have to be educated. You have to understand what this means. You have to, because again, if we reduce the opposite gender just to, that's all it is. Women, for men, women are only objects of, of, of sexual desire and, and, and women are uh, is looking at men in, in, in a way that is, uh, is somewhat similar, but a little bit different. Then we have a problem because that's, that, there's no, how are we going to grow? There's no way to grow. We can't, we can't go anywhere. When, when the word gender becomes an identity, when I identify 
based on my gender I identify, based on my sexual orientation. Islam, that was never the case. You walk into a masjid, you're not, uh, you don't walk into the masjid and say, I am a male and I'm attracted to females, and you walk in and the male, I am a female attracted to, no, I don't care, I don't want to know. Don't, don't, don't share that. Don't share that. That's no, 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 no one's business. You don't go out, we don't do that in our masjid to begin with. Like, we've never historically where we, do we ask people, uh, what are you and what are you attracted to? So we can know where to put, no, that's not, that's not, that's not a part of discussion. It's, it's very disrespectful. Whatever you're attracted to, that's between you and yourself. It's not, I, I shouldn't know about that. Don't tell anyone about it either. Whether it's a person or a door, don't, don't bring that up. It's not, this is something that's very specific between you and yourself. Really, Islam is about, okay, how are we going to organize proper relationships between the opposite genders so that we can have families, so we can have offspring, so we can have actual units, so Islam, the baton of Islam can be handed down to the next generation appropriately, and people can live with some degree of harmony in their lives. So when you use the word gender like that, and you start making it fluid, and it becomes there's more than two. I mean, the X Y yeah, the X S. That's not that's not what we're going to actually go by thing go by anymore. We're gonna we're gonna open the. Then it loses all meaning. It loses all meaning. Then people get very confused. You have to understand, sexuality is a very confusing thing for the human being. It's a very it's a very um, a delicate aspect of our existence. It can be skewed really, really horribly. Like it, it, you, you can mess it up really badly for both men and women if you expose people to the wrong things, if you expose them to the wrong thought process, if they're stuck in situations where they are being treated in a way that people who are molested or abused as children, they grow up and they're usually, they usually struggle for the rest of their lives with building relationships with any gender and finding any form of intimacy in their lives because, because you mess with something that is very delicate at a young age and now and, and you've sent it in a direction that's hard for it to, you know, to, to, to go in. This is a, yeah, this is not the best topic to talk about in Ramadan, I'll admit to you. But it's worth taking time and thinking about. Understanding that we have a problem. We have a problem. We've reduced some of the most ifa and haya and hijab and yeah, the relationships and alaqat. We've reduced this, these things to, 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 to concepts that are very simplistic and they're very harmful. They, 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 they harm our ability to be together, to work together, to respect one another, to be professional with one another. This is what I, yani, what is ikhtilat? Ikhtilat is when we're dealing with one another without the boundaries, when we're flirtatious, when we're thinking the wrong thing, when we're speaking in the wrong way, when we're, suge when we're being suggested but not clear about what we're trying to do here, and we're, and we're putting out messages that are confusing to the opposite group, both, both, but, but that's what ikhtilat is. When physically we are not putting boundaries, when psychologically we're not putting boundaries, when ethically we're not putting boundaries. That's what ikhtilat, and that's, what the, that's the haram piece of it. But ikhtilat in general, meaning men and women working together, that's not haram. Men and women working with one another, building their community together, taking care of, uh, of their society, talking about, about where they need to go and where they are. And that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just when we don't know where the boundaries are, ikhtilat becomes a problem. To say that, okay, men and women are segregated permanently, that's, that's just, that doesn't, they've tried, that didn't work. They tried it, they tried it. They tried like other parts of the world tried it, didn't work. It turned into something. I, I, grew, up in, I grew up in Saudi. It doesn't work. Oh God, it doesn't work. It's very problematic. What you're seeing right now, I mean, you may see it to be a political problem. It's not really political. Maybe the, pol the politicians are, are, are doing something that, that's completely unacceptable, but I, but I live there. What you're seeing right now is the, uh, is the normal yeah, I mean, progression of a society that was deprived from any form of yeah, I mean, sexual education and any ability to deal with, with the opposite gender and learn how to do it appropriately and be corrected when you make a mistake so that you learn how to do it. And if you don't have that, then you grow up and there's all these problems. And, and, and it comes off, it, comes, it, comes, it explodes. It's like, it's like you're, 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 just pressing, you're just suppressing something until it just comes out. And it comes out very, as ugly as we're seeing it right now. And if you believe al when it's not, you don't want to see stuff like that happening in the, in the Holy Land. The types of permissible gender relations, I've talked about this in, in previous khutbas, there's a lot of different types of relationships. The, the educational, a teacher, a student, or a student teacher. Um, there's uh, co-workers, there's um, classmates, uh, there's emergency situ situations, uh, there's the patient-doctor uh, relationship. There's a lot of relationships where, where yeah, any, uh, lines that wouldn't be yeah, any, uh, crossed elsewhere would be, would be crossed here because of the fact that, so I, you can stand and speak, if I'm a teacher and I have a student, I stand and I talk to her for an hour. As long as we're talking about the knowledge and the text, and there's nothing wrong with this, is when we deviate and start going into stuff that has nothing to do with this relationship. As long as you understand the parameters of the relationship that you have, you're safe. The moment the person in front of you starts leaving that parameter, he's like, ah, no, I'm not. We're coworkers. We'll talk about the projects and the work. The moment the person goes into something different, then make your intentions clear or stop doing that and go back to what we're talking about here. Um, that appropriateness, that understanding, then the importance of having those boundaries within relationships. Um, there's social relationships. People who are your neighbors, people who are your relatives. Arham. 
You'll talk about stuff that retain that, that attain to that to that type of the relationship, and that's fine. It's not hard. You know, I need to understand what you know, I need. Uh, when you're saying you're putting out messages that are confusing and you're opening doors to something that you shouldn't be opening doors to, men and women, it, it, it's something that we know when we're doing, and the opposite. Usually, opposite the person you know, on the other side of it kind of knows as well. And it's knowing when to draw those lines and boundaries and say this is not you know, the way to do it. So gender issues and gender relations are, this is, this is probably the biggest topic of all. I put it at the end, just I want to say that this matters, it's also reduced, but it requires a much, much more you know, in-depth conversation so that we can deal with the realities of them, of it in, in our society. I'll end with that, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive me, this was a longer one. I know I've said that every single day for the last five days, but uh, I'm trying my best to, bring, to break this down to something shorter, but it's, 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 a, it's a quite challenging. So inshallah, you're finding it beneficial. Please use the Q&A code for feedback as well. Uh, every year, you know, when I do these seven episode series, I try to get feedback and then I use it to refine uh, the, when I do it again. Like when I do it again in the future, I try to, and I take the feedback, I think about it, I reflect upon it, and I try to you know, incorporate some of the pieces of advice that are offered to me in the next time, in the next run, when I try and do it again in a year or two or, or more, um, or when I present it in a different uh, any setting to help people any benefit from it more. So I appreciate any, any, any type of feedback that you want to offer. And again, any questions you're welcome to use the Q&A Q code for. Otherwise, uh, I'll take verbal questions that get priority and uh, those of you who would like to leave there we're done and you're welcome to leave